All right, let's get started. Well, thanks to everyone for joining us, um, and thanks to anyone who's tuning in out there. Uh, we published an article yesterday about the media that hit Shelly Banks and also touched on what some groups are doing as far as tracking and cataloging them. So with this chat, we're hoping to learn a little bit more about what you guys do, how it relates, and ultimately look at the question, should we really be concerned about asteroids? And um, if we have time at the end, we have a few questions from our readers, I believe. I guess we'll check on that. But to start, uh, can we just go around and have each of you introduce yourselves and maybe give a little brief rundown of what you do? Dr. Abel, we'll start with you. I'm the curator of meteorites at the American Museum of Natural History, and I'm also chair of the Division of Physical Sciences, which includes astrophysics and earth and planetary sciences. I study meteorites primarily, uh, how they form, what they tell us about the early solar system, what they tell us about planets, because of course our only samples of Mars are, are of course meteorites, and also what they tell us about um, uh, the dynamic history of the solar system through the impact craters they leave behind on, on not just the Earth, but especially Mercury and, and, and the Moon. Right, great. Uh, oh, and I'm at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Beautiful museum. All right, Sergey, let's move on to you. Hi. I'm, uh, I live in Chelyabinsk. I'm a PhD student at Chelyabinsk State University, and I work at this university, uh, I study. I also an astrophysicist. I study accretion disks of young stars, and I was an eyewitness of this Chelyabinsk event. Uh, so. All right. That's great. All right, and Tim. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, it's nice to be here. Um, I'm Tim Spar. I'm the director of the Minor Planet Center, which is operated at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The Minor Planet Center, or MPC, is the nerve center for asteroid observations and information for the world. So we accumulate and distribute all of the positional measurements of asteroids. Uh, we compute all of the orbits. Um, if there's a short-term impact coming, we will announce that, preferably with more warning than 30 seconds. Um, and we do a, a good bit of work coordinating the worldwide survey effort to try to, you know, be as efficient as possible for detecting not only near-Earth asteroids, but asteroids and comets in general. Very cool. Well, to dive right in, I, I know we kind of centered the article around your story, Sergey, in that day, um, but could you just walk us through in a little more detail uh, what happened that day from when you woke up and heard the explosion and then found out that it really was a rock in space? Uh, well, I was asleep when the explosion uh, in, it was uh, early morning, uh, 9.20 in the morning. So it was very sunny. Came down from the horizon and I I was awakened by the very loud sound and shaking, uh, and I saw that my window opened very rapidly and with, with a very loud sound. Um, I rose up from the bed, uh, go, uh, went to the window to see what's going on, uh, but my window faces to the uh, east and the explosion were to the south of Chelyabinsk, so I didn't see anything, and I went to the balcony. From my balcony, I... Uh, a window at my balcony were broken. There were a lot of uh, glass pieces on the floor, and from the window I saw a trail in the sky, very big white trail from the meteor. Uh, then I and my brother, we came out to the street to see in the details on the trail. There were a lot of uh, people on the street, they were discussing what was that, and uh, all, almost all of them thought that it was a plane crash. Uh, then I went to the, my university 
It uh, and by the way, to the university, I saw uh, a lot of broken windows, in the buildings, and a lot of uh, people in the street, and all of them were quite excited and nervous in discussing this event. Uh, well, my university, uh, I discussed this event with my colleagues, and we uh, thought from the beginning that it was meteor, and we started to make in some estimates of the explosion energy and of the distance to the explosion distance from Chelyabinsk. Um, there were a lot of uh, talks with my friends and colleagues, discussions, and uh, uh, all friends shared their experience. Many of them were scared because uh, many people uh, saw uh, this explosion uh, and Uh, when they were at work and uh, at home. Well, I guess it's all about the day. Yeah. Um, going to you, Dr. Abel, I, you know, this made the news and everyone was so, I guess, surprised. No one was expecting this. Um, and I know when we talked to you for the video, you touched on just how many how much stuff falls from the sky every day, um, whether it's big ones or dust. Can you go into a little more detail about that? Well, it's, it's not terribly well constrained, actually, but there is a tremendous amount of space dust. This is the zodiacal dust that we can see, actually, in, in the plane of the, of, the, of the solar system. And this constant flux of dust is estimates range as high as 100,000 tons per year uh, across the Earth at random. And we can find uh, small particles in deep sea cores in, in, if we melt a lot of ice in Antarctica. And it ranges in sizes up to uh, little spherules, which are actually from bigger things that when they come in through the atmosphere, they ablate. They, they, the, the outside melts, and those little melt droplets uh, solidify as, as micrometeorites, if you will, or cosmic spherules. And these can be found as well. So maybe. Uh, Several things the size of a fist might land on the Earth somewhere per day. I think Tim has a better sense of the larger object flux, um, but but hitting thing hitting populated areas is actually very difficult for a meteorite to do, which is a good thing because humans are concentrated in in cities and towns, and the most of the Earth is on is, is unpopulated because it's ocean or ice cap or uh, desert that's not very uh, hospitable. Sure. Yeah, Tim, jumping to you. Um, well, first, can you just describe in a little more detail what it is that you do at the Minor Planet Center and how you're able to calculate these orbits based on the data from observers? Sure. Um, we accumulate literally all of the data in the world on, on asteroids. So it's, um, it's actually just positional measurements and time. So you, you look at the sky and you see something measure its position and then it moves and you know you put those together and send them off to us and uh, in a typical day we see we receive tens of thousands of observations of individual objects it's a big deal so we um, we received 2.5 million observations of individual asteroids last month alone so it's a it's an IT job in the extreme I've got good you know information technology people um, we have algorithms that run to check everything that comes in to see if it's a known object. And uh, we've got a catalog of several hundred thousand objects right now. Almost all of those are not things that can hit the Earth. And so we have to get everything processed down to where we have the few things remaining and then check those if they might be capable of an impact with the Earth in the near future. And so it's a, it's a sort of rapid turnaround job to boil things down to that level. And... Uh, those objects are posted on a web page where anyone in the world can go observe them 
send us more observations and we'll improve the orbits. You know, every little bit we get allows us to trace the track of the object just a little bit better. Um, Can I jump in and ask a question, Eric? Yeah, please, go ahead. Um, so I've heard that it likened to, um, because this data is posted right away, um, you get people panicking because the um, you've observed the tennis ball in the first inch after it left the racket of the server, and people are already thinking that it's going to land in bounds or out of bounds. And so, could you speak a bit to the to the number of observations you need to really nail down whether something is actually a threat or not? Yes. So, and and. Right away, I want to distinguish between things that may hit soon, like in the next few days, versus things that may hit in a decade or two decades. Uh, the, the current surveys, which are funded by NASA, are trying to find large objects that might be threatening decades out. So you have plenty of time to think about what to do and launch a mission. Uh, those objects take often take a year's worth of observations before you can tell if it's something that may hit in 20 years. So that's a long-term procedure. For the, we've had two objects where we were able to predict impacts, 2014 AA and 2008 TC3, and with those, 70 minutes worth of observations guaranteed the impact. So it's a very binomial distribution, right, or bi bipolar if you want to be, right? So some, some take years and some take a couple hours. Sure. Can you talk a little more about AA? That was the one that was just uh, discovered on New Year's Eve, right? Yeah, and, and um, this was typical, right, where we were all actually off on a federal holiday, and my buddy Richard Kowalski at the Catalina Sky Survey, who also found the previous impactor, 2008 TC3, he found this object and sent it in, and uh, by the time any of us staggered back to the office after New Year's Eve parties, um, it had already impacted the Earth. And uh, so that was, again, these are very small objects, these two, much smaller than Chelyabinsk. And things like that hit every week or two weeks or every month, going back to Dr. Abel's uh, question earlier. So there, the flux is fairly small of even meter-sized objects, but it's a few a year. And t t 2008 TC3 was a, um, a, a very rare meteorite type, actually, that landed in the Sudan. And uh, Peter Janiskins of NASA Ames actually went there and organized searches for it. And it is now in collections, primarily in Khartoum in, in Sudan, but also has been studied. And this is the, was the first object ever that were actually the, 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 was observed as a near-Earth object and then actually recovered as a meteorite on the ground. But again, it fell in a place where if we hadn't known it was coming, it might have been very difficult to, to even find it. Definitely. Sure. And Dr. Abel, I remember when we were talking to you to begin with, you mentioned that sometimes people find rocks like big or small, normally small, in their backyards. And depending on the country, they can they can sell them to museums, correct? That is correct. It depends on, on a lot of factors. It depends also if museums have the um, wherewithal uh, to buy them, uh, which is not always the case. Um, I have here actually a little bit of the Chelyabinsk uh, L4, LL5 chondrite. As you can see this, I don't know if your viewers can see this piece. It's quite small. But this is typical of the size. This thing broke into many, many, many small pieces. And you can see on the, in the, where it's broken, you can see the inside, but the outside is this black fusion crust. This is the last bit of molten material that froze in place and has a matte finish, like a, uh, people remember photographs, will know it. it's not a glossy rock. It's, it's an ordinary chondrite. Why do we call it ordinary? Because 85% of meteorites are ordinary chondrites, hence ordinary. And these are not from a planetesimal that formed a core and a mantle. These are from objects that did not differentiate into core and mantle like planets do. Um, so if they land in people's backyards in the United States, they own those meteorites. And for example, a couple of years ago, a meteorite fell in Sutter's Mill, California. It was observed near Sutter's Mill. It was observed in, in, in several states coming in from the east. 
it was also observed, again, this is a fairly new technique, by weather radar, uh, and Mark Fries and, and others were, were able to get to the site very quickly before meteorite hunters, uh, and perhaps people are familiar with the show about that, um, before the meteorite hunters were able to get there, our scientists actually were able to find some of these in, on public roads and, and places where uh, they weren't in uh, private property. And then the hunt was on, of course. And But a lot of that meteorite was, was made available for study. And in fact, my museum, I was able to uh, purchase some from finders in whose yard or ranch land the, the rock had fallen. Uh, but it, And again, it was a scientifically important rock because it was not an ordinary chondrite. It was called what's called a carbonaceous chondrite, uh, which is more primitive uh, early solar system material. Okay, that's a good segue into what I was about to ask. So how, how can you tell the difference between just a regular rock on the ground and a rock from space? Kind of like what you just talked about, is it? Well, yeah, it, it, as I was pointing out with this, these little pieces, this is another piece. Uh, this is, a, again, Chelyabinsk, which is, the outside of this has got this fusion crust. It's not from burning, it's from melting. It's very thin but it's definitely a glass. And in, the, in this case, it has very small crystals, needles, of a mineral called magnetite, which is an iron oxide, which give it this matte finish look. And that is the most diagnostic, but of course, that is the first thing to go when the rock starts to weather in the terrestrial environment. It's, these rocks don't like water. They fall apart easily. Most people think of iron stones as being meteorites. But in fact, only about 4.5% of meteorites that fall to Earth are irons. And we know this only because in the 70s, we and the Japanese and now other countries started to collect in Antarctica, where the entire flux over, over about 100,000 years uh, is preserved. And as those rocks get exhumed from the glaciers on, in which they're embedded, we, we recover them and we can understand now the the, 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 the uh, probability of different kinds in the rock record. However, iron meteorites tend to not break into small pieces like uh, Chelyabinsk did, and they also tend to uh, be very uh, much more uh, resistant to weathering because water cannot infiltrate along grain boundaries and break them apart. So we all know that Chelyabinsk is a pretty rare occurrence. Um, so it's been almost a year now, Sergey. Uh, and you mentioned when we talked earlier that you know, some shops sell souvenirs. There's a yes a, a statue that might be put in place. Um, how else has it changed the culture? I mean, you said everyone was pretty scared and understandably so. But is it even talked about anymore aside from maybe seeing a, a sign about it in a shop? Uh, now there there are a lot of. Uh, Meteorite and people uh, shops selling the magnets with photographs of the trail, and uh, they sell um, candies named after the meteorite. And now people uh, talking about. Uh, are talking about this event only in the positive uh, meaning. Well, that's all I, I guess. So, may I ask a question? Yeah, please. Yes. Do. So, does this mean you actually have tourists that come to visit Chelyabinsk just to see where the meteorite landed? As I know, yes, uh, there are tourists. Uh, Chelyabinsk and from all over the world. That's really interesting. No. <laughs> yes. This is strange because uh, uh, now uh, in the area where uh, below the trajectory there is no signs of the meteorite, so just the trees and nothing else. 
There's not well, even people, a hole in the ice anymore. It's gone. Yes, <laughs> it's yes, yes. The There's only a collection of meteorites in the, our local history museum. And some postcards and booklets about this event in the museum, in the uh, shops. Sergey, did you, um, when, when these rocks come through and they landed in the snow, I saw some beautiful pictures of how they made little uh, um, holes which holes, were yes. lined with ice. Did you see those with your own eyes? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, our university, we uh, entertain uh, three expeditions to find the meteorites and I and my colleagues we actually found some meteorites in the snow. We, I saw these holes and this ice uh, tubes. Uh, yeah, tubes. tubes. Yes, tubes. Yes. So it was a first and definite sign to determine that it is the meteorite piece in the winter. So is anyone you talk to that lives there worried about something like this happening again? Or is it kind of an understanding that it's just it's a freak occurrence? Oh, please repeat. I Sure. Uh, is anyone there worried about this kind of event happening again? Uh, yes. Uh, ordinary people are warned about it, but we... Uh, Tell everyone that this is uh, uh, fallen of meteorites of such uh, size is quite rare in the uh, certain area. So it is very small probability that uh, such a meteorite impact Chelyabinsk in the no. Okay. With Tim, I actually have another question for you. Um, we talked about this when we spoke, uh, and in the article we mentioned the B612 Foundation and um, NEOCAM, both organizations that are hoping to, to launch an orbiting telescope to better track asteroids. Um, do you think this is a worthwhile investment? Well, um, I'll answer this carefully. I'm employed by NASA. I, well, I'm employed by the Smithsonian, but NASA pays my bills, right? So they that's a grant that goes through. Um, the B612 is a private foundation, and NEOCAM uh, was proposed to NASA's Discovery Missions Program. And so, you know, any sort of conflict of interest or bias I might have is being announced ahead of time. My answer is yes. I think that we need to do an infrared survey from space. And uh, I think, you know, the B612 Foundation has talked about the amount of money they need to raise being actually quite small compared to other things the foundations do. You know, you build a, um, a wing in a museum, it can cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, all the same, there's a lot of um, benefit to having NASA do this. NASA has a, you know, a, a rather storied history of launching spacecrafts that do what they are supposed to do. And so I'm perfectly understanding of both sides of this. And um, my bias is that I want the darn thing done. And I want a space-based infrared telescope. And I want more telescopes doing this work. And we'll, you know, as we go forward, if you want to talk more about, you know, chances of doing this, of being hit, or why we, why we do the survey, I think there's compelling reasons to do it at the level of a few hundred million dollars. And, you know, you think the, the FAA, we spend an awful lot of money, and planes are darn safe because we spend an awful lot of money on it. Sure. I think I think what Chelyabinsk uh, told us uh, in, on February 15th was that we were watching actually that very uh, week because at the same time a very large object was coming close to the Earth that we already had known about for a year and Tim can speak more to that but we were looking at that and saying we just dodged a bullet the we know the bullets are out there and then this very small uh, body 18 meters which is really uh, quite small 
comes very clo comes and hits us, which we, we couldn't see that at all coming. And and it was a wake up call. And it's yes, as Sergey says, these things are the probability is small. But if you uh, integrate that probability over the next hundred years, it gets the probabilities go up. And if you integrate it over the next 300 years, the probabilities go up some more. So, and we know now that these objects, um, the smaller objects, are can be quite dangerous. Uh, Chelyabinsk is a city of over a million people, and it also is uh, near where there used to be uh, storage of, of nuclear waste from bomb making. And and these kinds of things should scare people, I think, uh, because something the size of 50 meters, 100 meters, would have potentially hit the Earth, reached the Earth, and caused a tremendously uh, larger uh, effect. Yeah, well, so there were three of us that were actually presenting to the Science and Technical Subcommittee at the Committee of the Peaceful Use of Outer Space in Vienna. The freaking United Nations saying, here's our plans for an asteroid warning network, and the Earth got hit the day one of us was presenting. Wow was quite ironic. We were there because we were talking about 2012 DA-14. Uh, that was one one reason that people were there, and also talking about the, the things that we have in place. So it was um, uh, certainly resulted in a lot of scrambling among those of us that had to present, because our, our world changed the instant that that object hit in Russia. Tim, could you could you speak to the grand challenge issued by the president of the United States uh, very soon after? Yeah, I can I can speak a little bit about that. I need to be careful again. Um, my honest view on this. Okay, well, what is it? Yeah, I want to make sure what we're talking. We're talking about involving the public and doing some work to help the study of near Earth asteroids. Um, and there, there's some branch, you know, some part of this that involves the public. There's all sorts of other things going on. People contribute some ideas. This field has advanced so rapidly among professional astronomers that the detection, discovery of near Earth asteroids is uniquely done by professional observers now. And so uh, I just did the statistics, computed statistics recently. Somebody was asking. Right now, 3% of near-Earth asteroids are discovered by non-professional teams. And so what we need to be doing, if we wish to enhance the discovery rate and, in effect, create a better warning system, is that we must spend more money. And there is no way around this. It is the, you know, this, it's like the, the uncertainty principle. There is no way to do a better job on this without spending the money, right? And then at some point, it will require an enormous amount of money. If we wanted to find all of the Chelyabinsk-sized objects and warn the Earth, that l requires billions of dollars to do it. And at some point, you have to ask if it's, if it's worth it at the cost-benefit level. But it is quite expensive to do that to find the one kilometer objects, the ones that would have um, had a chance of altering civilization if they hit the Earth, that only required a few tens of millions of dollars to do. And so there is a cost-benefit analysis that, you know, right up the alley of um, any insurance specialist, they could sit down with their pen and paper and their computer program and tell you how much to spend a year based on what the threat was. I'm I'm reminded that that the 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 best preserved meteorite crater on the Earth, which is Meteor Crater in Arizona, is about a kilometer in diameter. You can go visit it. It's a fine place to go for a vacation. Uh, that area of the country, and it fell approximately fifty thousand years ago, one kilometer hole in the ground. It would look we wouldn't even notice it on the moon. It's that small. And that was probably about a 30 meter iron, we know it was an iron, 30 meters in diameter, rock, roughly. That's the calculation. So how much would it cost to get, find all the things that are, say, 30 meters or bigger? Well, there was a study done, um, been a set of studies sort of commissioned by Congress. Congress says, hey, NASA, can you do this? There was one done by the National Academy just recently. 
and they throw the numbers out there on that. And um, they recommended the academy did, you know, if you wanted to defend against anything that would cause significant damage, you wanted to go to sort of 50 meters diameter, find everything down to 50 meters. And I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but I believe the lifetime cost of such a survey is in the billions of dollars. One to two billion. So it's like a small war. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or it's a couple of dreamliners. That's the way I like to say this sometimes. Or, or you know, like the right wing of an, an F-35 stealth fighter or something like that, right? Uh, it sounds really expensive, but we bailed the banks out to the tune of, what, $780 billion? It's peanuts at the government level. It really is. Uh, Tim, can you talk a little bit more about, uh, you said a few weeks ago you met with the UN again to discuss uh, the, a warning network, and I know you said it was in its very beginning stages. Um, what what would that ideally entail? Is there anything else to report? Anything new? Yeah, I can I can talk a little bit about that. There's a we're preparing a little report on that, and I um, I'm a newbie when it comes to my interaction with anything associated with the United Nations. So I'm going to I'll try to make sure I get this right. Sure. The UN was interested in an international asteroid warning network. They were interested in being warned of objects that were coming and then also having an additional group to maybe plan space missions if an object needed to be deflected and also disaster management on the ground. So it's several pieces of this. Uh, the way the warning network is set up is that member nations that wish to participate can participate in this. The Minor Planet Center just works currently nothing has changed what we do. The, the UN didn't say go off and do this. We already serve one of the functions, which is to collect the data, distribute it, and communicate with the public, also uh, organize the observers. So we had a meeting of the steering committee for this network, the International Asteroid Warning Network Steering Committee. That's, that's what the meeting was. Very, very preliminary stages, mostly just informing people of what assets currently exist to do this work. And also we heard from several groups uh, that are interested in actually participating at the discovery level. And um, for example, we had Boris Shustov from Russia was there. And uh, yes, Boris, I know him. You know him? Yes, yes. He is a great guy. And I've, I've, um, I met yes. him in Vienna. And I, I enjoy my interaction with him very much. And he's extremely sharp when it comes to these matters. And uh, so we also had a presentation from the European Space Agency about building telescopes to do the work. So um, I'm very happy to report that there are a lot of people in a lot of countries interested in this problem. It, uh, Tim, is, it, is there a problem with north, south, northern southern hemisphere coverage with these surveys? Because it seems to me what you're talking about is northern hemisphere uh, nations uh, who are much more involved in this. And, how, how, is it get, how is it going to go to get, say, India or, or some of the South American nations involved in this kind of search? Uh, we have de definitely discussed this. It's, it's a little bit less of a problem because there's only about 30% of the sky we can't see. Um, from the, you know, we, we have telescopes in Hawaii, which is, is fairly south as far as the U.S. goes. Um, ideally, we would have telescopes distributed both in latitude and longitude. So I would love to see telescopes in, uh, you know, Chile has got great observatories. South Africa, there's been some discussion about them becoming involved in this. It will require the construction of a sophisticated observing facility, though. And this is one where um, the standard telescopes that observe small patches of the sky don't work. We need a wide field telescope that's able to slew quickly and a large detector, and that just amounts to a freaking lot of money. There's no way isn't around there, it. Isn't there an effort in Hawaii to put such a telescope on Mauna Kea? Uh, there's already the PanStars uh, project using a 1.8 meter telescope with a wide field camera. They're the world's leader in potentially hazardous asteroid discoveries. 
And so there's some discussion about um, having one of those in South America. There is the large synoptic telescope, you know, LSST. Um, it's a lot of discussion about things, but having a telescope that is specifically designed to discover near-Earth asteroids, um, as my buddy Eric Christensen says at the Catalina Sky Survey, we're all mooching off somebody else. Not one telescope has been built specifically to find near-Earth asteroids. Not one. The other question is, of course, what do we do when we find something dangerous? And I, I was showing these meteorites. We know what asteroids are made out of, sort of, but the material properties become a very important part of understanding how to deflect something. If it's a pile of pebbles, it's a lot different than a pile of boulders, which is a lot different than a solid, single, large object in terms of its mechanical and chemical response, even, to anything we might do. Oh, it is... It, it is a difficult problem beyond that. I'm happy that all I do is orbits because, you know, maybe someday we'll be like, hey, go deflect that, and then I just go back to, you know, sitting behind my desk, and somebody has to figure out how they're going to do that and how they're going to find out what to do because we won't know what it is without visiting it, most likely. Well, the radar observations, uh, Arecibo, for instance, and it's good to see that Arecibo is getting the attention it deserves as far as refurbishment, but... We study the rocks that, that fall to Earth, and they're the best analogs we have to the asteroids that are potential hazards. And so um, this is a plug, <laughs> unashamedly, having collections in, in museums. Um, for example, the 650-kilogram kilo main mass of Chelyabinsk is now in the Vernadsky Institute, or is it still in, in, this, in your city? Uh, it is uh, is in our local history museum. Uh -huh. But it's being preserved and it can be studied by researchers yes, for yes. a long time. In few, on uh, February 15, there will be a conference in the in this museum, uh, at which uh, organizers uh, uh, give access to all scientists to study this large fragment. Great, that's great. Um, I I am personally glad you have the biggest piece kept at home. I think that's right. Yes, I agree. All right, it looks like we're almost out of time. Um, I guess for one last question, I don't mean this to sound too sensationalized, but since this is the title of the Hangout, uh, and this is open to anyone, should we be concerned about asteroids right now? Um, I'm happy to take my short stab at this. Is that all right? Please do. Yeah. Uh, I tell everybody I sleep well at night. You should, too. And for big objects, we're doing an awfully good job. If we want to find the small... If, if, if society and governments determine that we want to find the 20-meter objects to prevent Chelyabinsk from happening, uh, then we need to spend more money. But being concerned about it just isn't going to do any good one way or the other. And... We need to work on finding the smaller objects. The search for larger objects is progressing rather nicely. And uh, the fact that there is worldwide interest in the problem suggests to me that we're going to get more work done on it. That is right. We should be looking, but we shouldn't be afraid. <laughs> we definitely should, I agree. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks a lot, everyone. I really appreciate you taking the time, especially you, Sergey. I know it's almost 1 a.m. there right now. Um, it's okay. But <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, thanks again. I really appreciate it, and thanks to those listening in, and um, it's been fun. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks. All right. Goodbye. Bye.